So for companies that don't currently have a usage-based pricing model, what are they missing out on? Usage-based go-to-market models are special in a couple of different ways. Um, increasingly, we're seeing fatigue around subscriptions. We're seeing increased pressure in B2B scenarios to ensure that value is delivered for every dollar, that uh, terms are flexible. And uh, we're also seeing vendors who want to increasingly put their products forward, believing they have a, a great product and drive growth by getting those great products into the hands of customers. Usage-based pricing models allow you to settle on a point in a spectrum of usage-based pricing models. It's not an all or nothing proposition. Um, Think of uh, sort of the far left side of the model as the traditional one-time sale or transaction, all the way through to pure, pure usage. There are many steps along the way. And for companies who, who aren't considering innovation around their pricing or around their go-to-market models, they're missing out on a lot. And what they're missing out on are things like increased retention by customers who see better value for money on usage-based go-to-market models, who uh, they, they miss out on the opportunity to upsell more easily to customers who may have, uh, in a usage-based model, put money on account and are happy to draw down money from that account across all of the products and services within a customer's portfolio, which reduces, uh, removes a huge barrier to cross-selling. In addition to that, you're missing out on the competitive aspects of being able to shift the risk dynamic in the vendor-customer relationship and help your sales teams to shorten their cycles, to entice customers to come try your products and services or switch from a competitor. And you know, lastly, uh, though this isn't an exhaustive list, the very practice of implementing a usage-based go-to-market will introduce, by necessity, a type of discipline around your enterprise architecture, data management, and retention and the way that you contemplate your costs and the value that your customer receives from your products and services in an entirely new light. So I could probably go on for several minutes on an exhaustive list of, uh, of benefits that you would be missing out on by not exploring a usage-based monetization or go-to-market model. But those are some of the highlights is that you might be missing out on sales and revenue growth. You might be missing out on customer retention and lifetime value. You might be missing out on the wealth of information that a usage-based infrastructure can generate for your business and the insights that you could glean from that. What are the most common misperceptions that companies have about them? Um, one of the common misconceptions is that usage is an all or nothing proposition. And it's not that. It's a very sophisticated spectrum. It is shades of gray. Um, and finding the right shade for your business, for your product, for your customers is an important part of this practice. So sometimes business leaders will be tentative in embarking on this journey because they're not sure how their forecasting is going to change. And can I still produce a sensible and accurate budget for my board of directors? Or you may have a finance or IT leader who's got the systems are, have been working fine for 20 years. Why would I change them now? Uh, whilst you have a, a product or marketing leader screaming at the top of their lungs that this, this innovation is vital or you will become a victim of your competition. Um, so those, I think, are, are some, of the, uh, some of the areas that are of great benefit. What are the most common mistakes people make when they move towards a, a usage-based business model? One of the, you know, some of the common mistakes are to assume that all things are equal in business and to just take what you have been doing historically and try to translate that directly into a usage-based model. Implementing uh, usage-based pricing allows you a flexibility to redesign your customer interactions as it relates to uh, commercials, where the money changes hand, how the customer perceives value. Um, so these, these models provide a, a great opportunity um, to, to influence those aspects of your go-to-market. For CEOs or CFOs whose organizations are adopting a usage model, what are the three questions they should be asking their teams to make sure that they're on a successful path? For businesses that are contemplating a usage-based model and uh, you know, as a CEO uh, or a CFO thinking about how should I be sort of challenging my team to ensure that we're ready for such a transformation. Um, I would start with asking questions around your product and market fit. And do you understand what it is that your customers are buying from you? You know, uh, when you use Uber to get from point A to point B, 
that is the value you are deriving from it is a movement from where I am to my destination. I don't care how much fuel was burned. I don't care how long I sat in the car. I don't care if the car had air conditioning. I don't care about many of those details. My value metric is a safe journey to the other end. And that's what's monetized. And that's what's put in my face as the customer when, I, when it's time to settle. And ensuring that you take the same approach and that you're asking questions of your product teams, do they understand what the dynamic is with your customer and your competition? Would a usage-based model help you to differentiate, help you to attract new, new customers, help you to upsell existing customers, help you with, your, with retention issues you may be facing? And understand why it is that you're implementing a usage-based model. The second question I would ask is, how is our data as an organization? And how is our understanding of our own enterprise architecture? And do we know in the systems that support and deliver our products and services, what type of data those systems are generating, where that data is stored, in what format it exists, and how can I get to it? Being prepared from an architectural perspective um, and asking your CIO, asking your CFO, if your financial systems or your IT environment at large is ready for, designed for, or prepared to start ingesting and marshalling usage telemetry around the organization uh, is another uh, vital part. So uh, customers and product market fit, pricing certainly, your environment and your maturity around your enterprise architecture, I think is another uh, a vital one. And third, I would uh, ask what, what is the competition and market doing? Is this model relevant to us? Is it relevant to our competition? Could it be something that is a competitive differentiator? Or could it be something that would help us to compete in the same way, but better? Uh, relative to what we've been doing historically. A lot of companies lack a lot of sales discipline and end up pricing deals in a wide variety of ways under the guise of this is what it's going to take to get this deal done. Uh, and then the consequence of that is it becomes very difficult to implement from an operations, from a billing point of view. One way organizations solve that problem or think about solving is they say, let's adopt a CPQ tool and that'll enforce sales discipline. Another way they look at it is to say, let's adopt a, a billing system that has more flexibility and agility that can handle any type of sales arrangement that can be dreamt of. CPQ or billing? I, I would uh, argue that more rigid rule sets cause sales to become more innovative rather than more disciplined. And particularly in enterprise dynamics, not necessarily in the consumer world or with a highly commoditized high volume product, but certainly in enterprise, almost every deal is bespoke. And the larger it gets, the more likely it is to have special terms and conditions. And if you're an enterprise B2B vendor and have 100,000 clients and each one has three special terms in their contract, that's 300,000 terms that need to be checked by a person throughout the year, need to be enforced at the time of billing, need to be entered into the financial systems. And then you have to repeat that process every three or 12 months, depending on what the billing frequency is. It can become very expensive and very prone to human error. When implementing a usage-based billing system, it's important to check if your vendor has the capacity to conduct automated contract enforcement. And that should be a core part of the platform in the same way that mediation is a core part of a usage-based platform to ensure that as nuances, ramp periods, termination fees are imposed or negotiated at the time of sale, they can be automatically enforced at the time of billing by the system and not by a human being who may be prone to make errors. A lot of companies say they can do usage pricing. For you, what's the litmus test to put to them to see if they really can? I think there are a few different tests of whether a vendor can actually do usage-based billing. One of them is gonna be around the data and the way that they handle data. And if you're engaging with a usage-based billing vendor, who is only capable of performing X times Y calculations, X units times Y price, they're probably not a real usage-based vendor. I would also draw attention to the data itself. And when implementing a usage-based pricing model, particularly in high technology, communications, IoT type segments, having a handle on the data or having a system which can get a handle on the data of your business is paramount. If a usage-based billing vendor isn't capable of ingesting via API or file or a serverless aggregation layer, billions of events a day, and then transforming or mediating that data to deliver it to your financial systems, to deliver it to your uh, CRM and CPQ systems, or to deliver it back to your general ledger, 
they're probably not a real usage-based billing vendor. And mediation is, is the capacity to ingest huge volumes of data and then transform it or throw out perhaps zero balance records or get rid of unnecessary data and then move the pure gold, the rocket fuel, that which you are going to monetize into the usage-based billing engine to perform very complex calculations on it. So I, I would look for both a complexity of catalog and pricing mechanism, which is superior to simple X times Y calculations, right? Because that's technically usage-based, but not really in practice. There's very few companies who will only do X times Y transactions. And the second major item is to look for a vendor's capacity to transform, ingest, and mediate data to deliver the end product, that, that information which you will monetize and record to your corporate systems back while getting rid of the billions of uh, errant or unnecessary pieces of data generated by your infrastructure. What are the characteristics or attributes of a business that when you see these characteristics or attributes, you say, this is the kind of company that needs a sophisticated usage billing engine? Sometimes you'll look at the product that the company is offering and the way that they're charging for it. And if those are not aligned with where their customers would perceive value. And for me, one example I always fall back on is poor old cable television, where there is an absolute mismatch between the amount of content that I consume over that media and the way that they charge, which is an opaque, locked in, flat fee, take it or leave it. Um, I know you only want this one channel, but I'm gonna sell you 800 and I'm not gonna do it any other way. Um, you know, that, that's an example that is rife for disruption through monetization. Um, even streaming providers today, when we think about uh, an example, um, we're all starting to get subscription fatigue. I know for myself, I've got multiple streaming subscriptions in the house. I, I cut, my, cut the cable cord years ago, but now I've amassed a collection of, of flat subscriptions. One of the essential components to a sophisticated usage pricing model is the ability to do mediation. How do you define mediation? What is it? Why do I need it? Why is it so important? Mediation is probably one of the most underrated and undiscussed uh, capabilities out in the market today as it pertains to usage-based billing or otherwise. And mediation comes from the telco industry. The term uh, is where it was, was first applied, but, but today more generally, I think it's known as data transformation. And what it is, is a system's capacity to ingest, in our case, all of the usage events from all of the systems across an organization. And for larger sense, this might mean thousands of databases. Uh, for our customer set, in some cases, 5,000 or more databases or uh, locations where information is collected from. You don't want to send all of that raw data, which might contain bad data, which might contain zero records, which might contain other information, through the calculation engine of your core systems. And mediation is the capacity to ingest all of the raw data from the multitude of, of different sources throughout the organization, throughout your stack, and to be able to transform it into a format which is ingestible by the endpoint calculation engine. Again, that might be an ERP system, a usage-based billing system, or other system. Uh, and to get rid of the unwanted or the, or the dirty or the unusable records uh, that come through in that raw ingestion of usage events throughout the organization. So mediation is a critical tool to be able to clean and transform and deliver information in the format it needs to be delivered in to the destination it must be delivered to. One of the key capabilities of a mediation engine is the ability to enrich data. How important do you think that is? And can you comment on that as it relates to, say, some of the new AI models where you need to really enrich the data that's coming and not just transform it dynamically as you described on the fly, do it in real time, but this whole enrichment piece? It's a great question, Andrew. Uh, and enriching data through a mediation platform is going to be increasingly vital to the way that we implement and educate, in particular, these generative large language AI models. If you think of uh, 
a tool today like a chat GPT or another uh, widely available BARD or another, another uh, generative AI tool, those publicly available systems are often educated on the publicly available information of the internet up to a certain point in time. And that's great when you want to have that AI generate content that is of general knowledge. So I can ask questions about Earth history. I can ask questions about companies from two years ago, right? Data that existed two years ago, or, or maybe less if I'm paying a little bit more for a more recent training model with those systems. But I would never be able to ask that AI, how should I modify the pricing of my products to improve my business? Which of my customers are likely to churn in the next 12 months and why? How can I stop that from happening? Could you recommend optimal pricing for me to go uh, drive cross sales by 10% from product A to product B? A publicly available AI model will never be able to answer those questions because it has not been trained on the specific customer, product, and service interactions of your business. In a mediation engine, we do this at Logisense, we use the mediation engine in something called real-time AI learning, where we ingest usage events, monetization events, billing and monetization data from our engine and others, and we can transform that and deliver it to a generative AI model to do what is called fine-tuning, which is continued improvement of the AI model. So every day as we get more and more information coming in, more products are purchased, more services are consumed, more interactions with customers take place, we can tell our AI about all of those things that have happened. And that's unique to our business because it's our monetization and our billing data. The mediation engine then takes that information and furnishes it to the generative AI model to teach it about what products your customers are using, which customers are growing, which are shrinking, when are they monetizing it, what is your seasonality. Every interaction that happens within the business that's relevant to training the AI can be mediated transformed to a format that's relevant for the AI's fine tuning and delivered to that AI. So mediation is not only a great collector of all of the multitude and, and various sources of data within your organization, once it's been ingested by the mediation engine, it can be transformed and delivered to an AI to help fine tune it every day on the specifics of your business, your customers, and your efforts in the market which means you'll start to be able to ask AI pointed questions about your business, your products, and your market. It's a huge amount of opportunity around mediation to help train these generative AI models. In your experience, you get called into Salesforce shops where they've hit a wall. What are the three most common things that companies encounter where they get frustrated by what they what they have with the Salesforce tools and where they're looking for some additional solution? Um, it, a, it doesn't support the volume of usage events that we need to ingest. And not that every one of those events is going to be uh, used to perform a calculation, but it will need to be cleaned out. It will need to be intermediated or mediated, um, and it will need to be transformed and then delivered uh, to the system which is going to do the, the actual billing. Uh, I think also the complexity and sophistication of, of the pricing catalog and the platform's capacity to deal with high volume scenarios where you may be ingesting billions or multiple billions of events per day um, are, are where you'll start to see some limitations. And that's where customers may want to start to, to engage with more of a, uh, a pure play usage based billing vendor. For organizations in which the sales and product teams really want to move towards a usage model, and yet finance is looking for predictability in the business, how do you balance that conversation of, we want to have this usage model, we don't necessarily know what revenue is going to look like in six or 12 months, with the finance need to model the business and forecast? Predictability is important. And you know some, some of what I will say next, uh, I say tongue in cheek. However, I think in its majority, it is true. And if your sole intention as a business leader or you're the CEO of one of these businesses and the only thing that matters to you is predictability, you should be asking yourself, what is the future and trajectory of your business? And we see huge disruption happening and have for the last 
20 years. World's biggest uh, hotel and accommodation provider doesn't own a building. Uh, world's largest transportation and logistics firm doesn't own a tire. And it's the information around those services and a, a novel way of delivering those services, which has, has helped, in this case, Airbnb and Uber, to move to the top of their categories because they have disintermediated the competition. They have consolidated and provided a digital experience. And that came with risk. How can we start a transportation and logistics company that owns no cars? How can we start a, a, a hotel and accommodation chain that has no bricks? And they did, and they were wildly successful in doing it. And though finance and, and often the CEO really like predictability because it's, uh, it's very easy to show up to a board meeting where you have done what you said you would do. But the risk in not innovating in this space could be catastrophic to you. Um, what happened to the competition of Uber and Airbnb? What happened to, I'll pull out some, some old, very, very colloquial examples. What, what happened to Blockbuster when Netflix showed up and started monetizing DVDs through the mail? What then happened to other mail, traditional letter mail providers when Netflix decided to start streaming online? And then look at the emergence of this entire class of uh, streaming providers that all popped up around the concept of a new model that was different than mailing physical media back and forth, different than having cable infrastructure piped into your house and, and paying for large, expensive, opaque packages from cable providers. That was commercial innovation within that industry. And it completely changed the competitive landscape. In some cases, completely bankrupt the number one in the industry. So while it's important that the CEO and CFO have a feel good, fuzzy, warm feeling that there is predictability, not listening to the product leaders, innovators, engineers within the organization and the customers outside of the organizations, I would contend, carries more risk than upsetting a board meeting by not having been 100% on plan from last year's projection. So there are ways that you can get accurate, which is to use all of this data that you're collecting to model before you implement and take these solutions to market, to Speak to experts like at Logisense and ask them, how is this done? What variants should we expect? What is the best model for us? Um, the worst, the most, you know, the most dangerous thing you can do is just adhere to the status quo. So I would encourage those sales and product leaders to keep making noise. And if you have a, a nervous or a risk averse CFO and CEO, paint it through the lens of competition. And what happens if one of your competitors makes this change first? Do you want to be the the, the leader in the category, or do you want to be one of these folk tales of a, a company like Blockbuster that just started to disappear from the earth because the aversion to change and to take a risk on these new distribution channels, which happened to be letter mail and then digital, meant effectively that the entire business model degraded uh, rather quickly in their case. What advice would you give to a product manager who really wants to have the usage data and better insights into how customers are using their, their product or service. Um, what advice would you give to them when they're trying to justify the investment in proper tooling? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the fastest way to go out of business is to never listen to a customer. Um, and simultaneously, one of the fastest ways to damage your business is to only listen to customers. <laughs> So uh, I think I think Steve Jobs had described that as the innovator's dilemma right. at that point in time. And um, a product manager can help to offset the unknown and the risk uh, around changing product go-to-market configurations, around changing the product itself, around changing the commercial model, if they have the data necessary to support their opinion. And I was a product manager in my career uh, for many years. And know how that how tricky this is to stand up and make an assertion with no data, but for the notes that you've collected, but for the anecdotal um, interactions that you've had with customers. I went to a user group and there were our 10 biggest customers in the room. 10 isn't a statistically significant sample. It's an anecdote, right? And it's hard as a product manager, a product marketing manager to make that, that case for that investment. But what I would encourage those product managers and product marketing managers to do is to articulate the accuracy that you're going to gain in a fundamentally understanding how your products are consumed and monetized. When are your customers using them? What is your seasonality? Um, and you can trade these things with CEOs and CFOs, which is to say, 
I can improve our price point and make sure that we're getting top dollar for it. I can ensure that we're competitive. I can, I can preempt churn events by our customers. I can take a look at where we may be able to offer new product. I can do all of these things, but I have to have access to the data and we need to invest in getting access to the data because today it is a, a mishmash. So, so for product managers uh, in similar roles, looking to invest in a usage-based monetization go-to-market um, and, and the systems necessary to do that within their organization, it's not just about your one product, though that might make the case if it is a, a darling product or there are high hopes around it. But in addition to that, you're going to get direct visibility into your specific customer and product interactions that you have never had before as a business and where you have been showing up to date voicing opinions around priorities within the product line based on opinion, anecdote, conversation with uh, what is what is a human's capacity. If you met with one customer a year, you could meet with 356 of them. Um, but no product manager can just meet with customers. However, I can have a usage-based monetization platform gathering billions of events and summarizing those and I can glean insight from them and inform my product decisions based on that actual data. And I think that's the that's the point upon which to hinge your case for a business to make investment in one of these technologies. Awesome.